Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming along today. Thank you to Leah and um, our sponsors for providing such a great conference in such a great venue. Hello to everyone out there in cyberspace. Um, I think we had some questions tweeted in this morning's panel. Um, if we get that, I'll try and answer in 140 characters. Um, I'm going to give a 10-year retrospective of price pressure analysis and merger simulation in the UK. So here's an overview. Um, because we've been using these tests for quite a long time in the UK, uh, we've heard a lot of comment around the utility of these kind of tests. So my aim today really is to take that comment and characterize it, or some may say caricature it, uh, into four different um, arguments. I'll try and then dispel those arguments and explain why I think, in spite of those arguments, price pressure analysis is really delivering on its promise. Before I do that, I'll give an overview of UK merger control and UPP, Guppy, IPR, and PPI. So um, what we have here in the top corner is a picture of soup that's really popular with kids in the UK. This is a tomato soup that has vegetables in it and uh, little letters made out of pasta, and this is called uh, alphabet soup. And commentators in the UK have taken to referring to price pressure analysis as alphabet soup. So what I'll do is I'll explain the UK merger control and then the ingredients of alphabet soup, but only briefly, because Joe and the others have been over that already. I'll then come on to my four characterizations um, slash caricatures of comments around these techniques. The first of which, market definition is dead. It's all over for market definition. I think I'm giving the answer a little bit away here with a picture of Mark Twain on the cover of Time magazine. Mark Twain, the very famous American author, uh, his obituary was published in the New York Times before he died. It was his cousin that had died, apparently. Uh, and when a journalist pointed this out to him, he remarked that rumors of his death were greatly exaggerated. Well, I think rumors of the death of market definition are greatly exaggerated, too. Three other comments I'll come on to talk about. Price pressure analysis is just too hard. No, wait, it's too easy. Either way, it's just too interventionist. And this is a Photoshop picture of a very aggressive looking guppy we have here. And then I'll come on to talk at the end about, um, perhaps somewhat contentiously, what's happened to merger simulation? Why hasn't it delivered on its promise in the way that I think price pressure analysis is delivering on its? So. Some background to the UK merger control system. It's voluntary, not mandatory, as we've discussed that this morning. Um, there are anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 mergers in the UK every year, according to our Office of National Statistics. And the OFT only examines around 100. And our sister authority, the Competition Commission, maybe 10 to 15 of those. Uh, the system is administrative and not judicial. So we have decision makers at first phase and second phase who are well versed in the language of economics. And in fact, maybe economists themselves, I'm a mergers decision maker, for example. The system is bicameral and not unitary. For the time being, at least, we have two authorities, ourselves and the CC. Um, and, and that means we have the possibility of first phase outcomes, first phase undertakings in lieu of reference, as, a, as was discussed this morning. And that gives us leverage over first phase outcomes uh, in a way that I think other systems don't have. Our system is, is well resourced, relatively speaking, um, not just in terms of the number of people working on projects, cases, but also in terms of the amount of time that we have. We have 40 days at the OFT for first phase assessment and 24 weeks second phase assessment at the CC, and that's pretty lengthy by international standards. Uh, and we lack compulsory information gathering for powers at first phase, so we need to be creative about the kind of evidence that we ask parties for. And I think those features have proved a really fertile breeding ground for price pressure analysis. And I think part of the reason that price pressure analysis has taken off in the UK are to do with those architectural sort of institutional factors. So to move on to the ingredients of alphabet soup, then, as I called it. Um, in a pre-merger situation here, you've got firm A, firm B, and firm C. Um, what is it that firm A thinks about before it puts its price up? So the PA up, their arrow. Um, it worries about business it's going to lose to its rivals, firm B and firm C. Um, that amount of business, called the diversion ratio, is represented by DAB from the diversion from firm A to B, and DAC for the diversion from firm A to firm C. <coughs> now, what happens if A and B merge? That's the, represented by the yellow box. Well, the fear that firm A had about putting up its price goes away a bit because it's going to recapture some of the business it would have lost, DAB. And, and if that business is really profitable, then firm A, the merged firm AB is going to have an incentive to put up its price. And that's the underlying intuition. 
So if you capture diversion ratios and profit margins, it tells you about an incentive to put prices up, and that's what unilateral effects is all about. Uh, one thing I want you to note is if I draw that yellow box around firm A, firm B, and firm C, the algorithm I've just described would be called market definition. So the input to the process is exactly the same, except to me it's much more intuitive to think about what a merged firm would do post-merger than what a hypothetical monopolist could do. So on to my first caricature characterization. Market definition is dead. It's all over for market definition. Um, as I'm an economist, here is a chart and some numbers showing that that's not the case. What we have here uh, in the purple triangle, you have the number of cases over the last five years where the OFT has used price pressure analysis, and that's represented in the top row of the table below. So you see in the financial year 2008 to 9, there were five cases that used this right up to the financial year 2013, just gone, where there's seven. That adds up to 22 cases over that period out of 425 mergers. Um, that's not a lot. That's about 5%. We also have... Um, other types of cases where we subjected them to an in-depth first-phase analysis, and we call that the case review meeting process, CRM process. And you can see, even see there, as a, as a percentage, PP analysis cases as a percentage of these other decisions is still pretty low, uh, about 15 to 20%. And the great majority of OFT first-phase merger decisions still rely on the traditional approach. And these are the 22 cases that I mentioned. Uh, I don't propose to go through them in, in any detail, Really, they're there just for your reference. The OFT publishes all merger decisions on its website. But one thing you can notice is that there are a lot of clearances, there are a lot of conditional clearances, and there aren't many references to the Competition Commission arising out of this. And the second thing is there are lots and lots and lots of retail mergers. And I think that's not a coincidence. This is a, a technique that I think is particularly applicable to mergers at the retail level, where shops sell stuff to people. And I'll come on to talk about that a bit later too. So the second myth, it's all too hard. Um, I think this has three components to it, that the analysis is too new, it's very complicated, and it always uses consumer surveys and they're just too expensive. Um, the I economic ideas behind these techniques are really not that new, they date back to the 1990s. Uh, and these techniques have been used by the OFT regularly since 2005. I think we've been in a position where, because it's an administrative system, and because our decision makers are, speak the language of economics, or maybe economists, it's been a little easier for us but I don't think that should be an impediment to the techniques being used more widely. I think they are more intuitive than some of the things we've already had success explaining to judges. It's too complicated. Well, as I've just explained, the ingredients for alphabet soup are the same as for market definition. But when products are differentiated, the narrowest market satisfying the hypothetical monopolist test will be very, very narrow indeed. And then price pressure analysis just looks more sensible. So what that means is the implication of that is the focus on diversion ratios and margins in the analysis um, is not a consequence of our move to these tests, this analysis. It is the cause of our move to this analysis. You need evidence on how closely firms compete. You need evidence on how profitable they are if you want to say sensible things about market definition. Why not use that evidence to say something sensible about what's going to happen post-merger instead? And I think the last criticism, it's always, it always uses consumer surveys, and consumer surveys are just too expensive. Um, it does use consumer surveys, that's true. Consumer surveys are expensive. Surveying tens of thousands of consumers can cost um, many hundreds of thousands of euros. But I think that needs to be seen in context. Engaging in a merger uh, is an expensive thing to do, firstly. Um, the opportunity cost of uh, not doing this kind of analysis is possibly having to do even more expensive analysis, incur even more cost for business at second phase. And thirdly, um, from the public policy perspective, if this is a technique, a type of way of thinking that's getting better public policy outcomes, then really where the costs fall needs to be thought of across the entire economy, not just necessarily on the firms that are suffering those costs. It also uses, in addition to surveys, evidence from internal documents, supply disruptions, market research, and econometrics. And in the last presentation, I think we touched on a few of those. So no, wait, it's all too easy. Um, the argument here is, how can you possibly get good information about unilateral effects just by taking two things and multiplying them together? That's just too good to be true. 
And, and breaking that down, there are two, two seem to be two different concerns, that the ingredients may be poorly measured. It's difficult to measure diversion ratios and margins, and I think that's true. But it's no more true of the ingredients of alphabet soup than it is of other types of economic evidence or other types of qualitative evidence. The fact is, we know it's hard to do this, and that's why we're circumspect about looking at this kind of evidence. That is not a reason not to look at this kind of evidence. There are lots of other tips of different types of evidence that we know have measurement errors in them, firms' internal business documents. Who knows how they were produced? We attach weight to them. The fact that we know something is mismeasured is not a reason to ignore it. It's a reason to attach the appropriate level of weight to it. I sound a bit like Donald Rumsfeld here, talking about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, and the second criticism here is that the analysis requires lots of hidden and unrealistic assumptions. Essentially, if all you're doing is multiplying two things together, there must be a lot of work going on in the background that you can't see in order for you to get to that place. Okay, so it's true that there are assumptions. There are assumptions not just in economic models, not just in this model, but in all models, in all different disciplines, in all sciences, social sciences, natural sciences. They exist to do two things. They idealize and they neutralize. They idealize the relationship between the things you're interested in investigating, and they neutralize that relationship from the impact of things that don't matter. So here we know unilateral effects depend on diversion ratios and margins. And these models and this analysis gives us the simplest possible way of capturing that without being infected by things that don't matter. That's true not only of price pressure analysis, but here's a more practical example that I hope will illustrate that point. Could you play the animation, please? So this is um, a map of the London Underground, the tube, as we call it, the central zone. It's a bit out of date, it's from 2004. But it's a model, and it's a model that assumes that all underground train lines run north-south, east-west, or at 45 degrees. And it doesn't represent the distance between tube stations accurately at all. Does that make it a bad model? It's a brilliant model. It's been copied the world over. If you want to see how brilliant a model it is, I'll show you a less restrictive form of exactly the same model. Could you play the animation, please? That is a geographically correct version of the London Underground map with the stations added. There's no way that is a better model than the first model I showed you, but it is a less restrictive model. And finally, here is the most, the, sorry, the least restrictive version of this model that one can imagine. Could you play the animation again, please? That's adding a street map. Is that an easier model to use than the first model? No, it is not. Why is that? Well, as the guy who created the original map, whose name was Harry Beck, said in 1933, when you're underground, geography doesn't matter. Connections are the thing. So my last criticism, it's all too interventionist. And here, I think the commentary is that the analysis is determinative, and by comparison to the traditional approach, it leads to more intervention. Um, Certainly for the OFT, the analysis is always seen in the light of other evidence. Here's a quote from a recent decision using these techniques. This is Unilever and Alberto Culver from 2010, which is a merger of manufacturers of um, uh, soaps, essentially. That the evidence on diversion and the guppy calculations corroborates this view, and the key word there being corroborate. The analysis here is not determinative. Um, Furthermore, in the UK, it's the party's commercial decision to offer divestments at first phase. So what we're not doing is undertaking price pressure analysis, deciding a number of parts of your merger, a part of your merger, a number of product markets or geographic markets, raise problems and therefore you must hive them off. We're looking at that evidence in the context of other evidence, saying there's a potential problem here, and it's then a commercial decision as to whether to offer divestments to us or not. So the analysis is not determinative. Uh, in terms of the traditional market share approach, market definition approach, neither does this approach lead to more intervention. Of the 22 price pressure cases I highlighted above, only four were referred to the Competition Commission. That's a reference rate of 18%, which is exactly the same as the OFT's reference rate for mergers that don't use this technique. And in the 10 conditional clearances on the slide above, the analysis was exculpatory to the traditional approach in eight cases and corroborative of it in two. Onto my last slide then. Why has merger simulation not delivered on its promise? So here we have my second piece of 
classic British iconography of the afternoon. This is a 225 gram Fray Bentos steak and kidney pie. This is a pie that comes in a tin that you bake in the oven. Uh, it's popular with tour um, tourists, sorry, students and old age pensioners in the UK. I very much doubt it's popular with tourists. Um, <laughs> So if I were to try and estimate the demand for this Fray Bentos classic steak and kidney pie, I would go and get scanner data from a market research company, uh, and I would take the volume sold in uh, a month, and I would take the value sold in a particular month. I would divide one by the other, and I would get a measure of average revenue. And I would call that price. Now, if I do that for this pie for November 2010, I get a price of 235.4126706 pence. Nobody paid 235.4126706 pence for that pie in November 2010. Why does that matter? It matters because when we do demand estimation, we assume a curvature for demand, and then we try and fit some data to that curve. But if you're using average revenue, and average revenue doesn't measure price, you're trying to estimate the curvature of demand using data points that cannot lie on the demand curve that you're estimating. For me, that has to be a problem. The second point is really in the context of merger simulation and demand system estimation being done for manufacturers, merges between manufacturers, where the data gathered is at the retail level. So here, it's a merger between people that make pies, but the scanner data is gathered from supermarkets. And that begs the question, are retailers and consumers' preferences the same? Now, clearly, retailers want to sell the products that their customers want to buy. But that's not the same as saying that their preferences are exactly the same. So my second critique of merger simulation. Uh, if retailers and shoppers think that past prices matter, then why aren't they in our econometric models? Was now or internal reference pricing uh, is very, very common in the UK. And here I've put up a particularly funny example. This is. Um, taken by uh, a photograph taken by a colleague of mine in the context of an investigation that the OFT was doing. And this is um, an av uh, was now pricing for imperial leather bath moments, which I understand is a kind of bubble bath. And it says price was one pound, now one pound 51. Save minus 51p. <laughs> in, the UK, in the UK, the OFT has had a lot of success engaging with supermarkets to stop was now reference pricing that's quite this silly, but the point is was now reference pricing is still, is still very, very common. And if retailers and shoppers think that past prices matter, we ought to include them when we're estimating elasticities. And my last criticism, I think, is about consumer behavior in the real world. Uh, OFT research suggests that 86% of shoppers in the UK don't use a shopping list, 40% uh, of purchases are made on promotion, and that shoppers prefer bulk buy deals uh, BOG OFF, which is a charmless acronym, stands for buy one, get one free, and three for two deals to explicit price discounts. Now, we know consumers suffer from behavioral biases when doing shopping, especially if they're not taking shopping lists with them. Shouldn't there be some sort of consideration of that when we're estimating demand? So all I've said is that I think market definition is not dead. I think that price pressure analysis is not too hard. I don't think it's too easy. I don't think it's too interventionist, and I think it's delivering on its promise in a way that merger simulation, unfortunately, isn't. Thank you.